Muy buenas tardes a todos y muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos esta tarde aquí en esta conferencia que inaugura eh, la nueva actividad de Casa Árabe en lo que a conferencias y charlas y encuentros con el público se refiere después del el merecido parón de las Navidades. Eh, así que aquí estamos de nuevo. Y en esta ocasión, con una conferencia que he de decir es muy esperada por nosotros, por los que trabajamos en esta casa, porque conocemos a, a las personas que están en la mesa conmigo desde hace tiempo, eh, por razones diversas y en proyectos distintos en los que hemos eh, trabajado, colaborado, hemos compartido. Pero por distintos motivos también nunca habíamos tenido la ocasión de invitarles a, a, pues, a hacer una actividad con nosotros, en este caso una conferencia y creemos que el motivo que hemos eh, buscado esta vez, que es la exposición T con Nefertiti y digamos toda la reflexión eh, en torno al arte que hay detrás de esta conferencia, pues es eh, eh, realmente justificado para, para que estén aquí hoy con nosotros, por lo cual estamos muy contentos y les doy las gracias antes de nada eh, por acompañarnos. Eh, Sam Bardawil, que es la persona que está en el extremo de la mesa, y Til Felrath eh, son los fundadores de una plataforma artística que se llama Art Reoriented y la verdad es que he de decir que tienen un currículum en sus espaldas absolutamente impresionante, eh, el, del cual me siento muy envidiosa. Eh, y creo que mucha gente que trabaja en este sector también, porque realmente han hecho muchas cosas y cosas muy bonitas y, y muy buenas. Y es por eso que nos parece además doblemente importante que se les conozca también en nuestro país, al cual me consta que están muy eh, emocionalmente vinculados. <risa> eh, ellos han comisariado numerosísimas exposiciones muy importantes, han trabajado mucho con centros de arte, instituciones que se han, digamos, han devenido instituciones claves del panorama cultural y artístico en relación con el mundo árabe, como es el Museo Madhav en Doha, que es un museo que se fundó no hace muchos años sobre la base de una gran colección de arte moderno y contemporáneo eh, eh, en manos eh, eh, privadas y que se va a poner a disposición del público para que la gente pueda conocer esta parte de la historia del arte universal que nos ha sido mm, que nos ha resultado más inaccesible por no estar en los museos habituales y ahora gracias a la creación de este museo esperamos que en un futuro se pueda eh, eh, contemplar la colección pues bien este museo eh, como parte de su programa de actividades para digamos darse a conocer eh, ha, ha desarrollado una serie de exposiciones eh, temporales muy interesantes, tres de las cuales han contado con el comisariado y la elaboración intelectual de los dos comisarios que tenemos aquí hoy con nosotros, Sam y Till. De hecho, la primera exposición que creó el museo, que abrió las puertas del museo, Toll and Toll Retoll, fue eh, una exposición eh, comisariada por ellos. ¿no? Bueno, pues esto simplemente, digamos, como un botón de muestra de, de lo mucho que ellos han hecho, eh, la exposición que da, digamos, argumento a la conferencia que vamos a, a, a escuchar hoy, T con Nefertiti, todavía se puede visitar en las salas del Instituto Valenciano de Arte Moderno, en, en Valencia, eh, que ha llegado allí después de un tour precisamente iniciado en este mismo museo, el Madhav de Doha, después pasó eh, por el Instituto del Mundo Árabe de París y ha recalado ahora en Valencia, en parte gracias también a la colaboración que hemos tenido eh, con Casa Árabe con ellos. Eh, Después de, este, de esta exposición están ahora ellos eh, eh, involucrados, en breve, en breve van a inaugurar una retrospectiva del artista Mona Hatum en este mismo museo. Han sido comisarios del pabellón de Líbano en la Bienal de, de Venecia y bueno, su currículum extensísimo, como decía, es, eh, eh, dice muchísimo de, de, de su enorme labor y su enorme contribución al mundo del arte eh, y a dar a conocer, lo que se refiere a dar a conocer los artistas, eh, de, sobre todo del mundo árabe. Eh, y creo que en parte lo bien que funciona es por el tándem de ellos dos, por sus dos digamos, eh, perfiles profesionales, eh, eh, Sam eh, vinculado al mundo del arte, a, a los estudios eh, eh, de arte y de teatro, eh, Til más vinculado a los estudios de relaciones internacionales, al diseño, en fin, son dos perfiles que unidos hacen un perfecto tándem y que ha permitido que muchos de estos proyectos hayan llegado a buen puerto siendo proyectos muy complejos que han conseguido involucrar a instituciones internacionales y a eh, ilvanar itinerancias que han hecho que los proyectos se pudieran ver por muchos públicos de muchos países. En definitiva, bueno, pues creo que son personas que merecen mucho reconocimiento por lo que han hecho hasta ahora. Así que, eh, sin más, 
les voy a dejar que nos eh, pongan en conversación con Nefertiti, que es la perfecta excusa para, eh, como vamos a poder ver, para reflexionar sobre un montón de cuestiones que tienen que ver con la posición de la obra de arte eh, eh, y con sus distintas interpretaciones, sus distintas, eh, eh, las imágenes di diferentes que proyecta según el contexto en el que es eh, ubicada eh, e interpretada. Pues adelante. Fantastic. Thank you for the amazing introduction. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're all set in terms of the headsets and the interpretation. I can begin. I apologize for not being able to speak in um, Spanish. Hopefully, the next time I'm here, um, if there will be a next time. <laughs> After such a long uh, and um, amazing introduction by um, Nuria, I hope that your expectations aren't very high. Um, but we are really very happy to be here and we're looking forward to the next you know, hour or so to share this project with you and have an interesting discussion together. Um, Tea with Nefertiti, the making of the artwork by the artist, the museum and the public. Um, this is more than just an exhibition. It is obviously an exhibition that includes works by 40 artists Um, most of the artists are contemporary artists, so in a way it is a contemporary perspective on the topics that we uh, reflect on in the exhibition. But it also includes works by artists from the modern period, so alongside very important contemporary artists we have artists like Modigliani, Giacometti, um, Uh, you know, uh, Kis van Dongen and other modern artists from Egypt in particular, and also ancient Egyptian works and works that are considered Islamic or Orientalist. So there's a lot of works that come together to tell a very complex story. How does this story begin or what triggered the story is something that we will be discussing over the next few minutes. But first, as me by means of introduction, we would like to show you a short clip that is slightly unexpected maybe, but it will set the tone or the historical background or framework for the ideas of the exhibition. So let us watch this film and then we can proceed. Dearest Victoria, we have finally arrived in Paris, and what a sight! It seems the whole city has been taken over by the World's Fair. Oh, and you can see the new tower they built for the occasion from almost everywhere in the city. What a marvelous way to celebrate the centennial of the French Revolution. But I can understand why not every country in the world thinks that killing their king or queen is something to celebrate. England and Germany, who still have royalty, did not participate in the fair. Yet it doesn't matter, the event is a huge success. There are exhibits from Europe, South America, the United States, and the French colonies. And. For the first time, visitors can come to the fair at night. 
The grounds are lit with that extraordinary new invention of Mr. Edison's, electricity. Why, the top of the Eiffel Tower even has a beacon that can be seen from miles away. The fair is open until 11 in the evening, and over 30 million people have come to see it so far. Why, they say it is the most profitable exposition ever. There are over 80 buildings clustered around the bottom of the tower, full of exhibits. There is the very long Galerie des Machines, overflowing with fascinating contraptions. There are also examples of, of how people live throughout the ages, an exhibit they call the History of Habitat. But the most popular place to visit well, besides Mr. Eiffel's Iron Lady, of course, is the Egyptian Bazaar and Cairo Street, or Le Rue du Caire. Oh, how exotic it is. They have recreated an entire street, complete with shops and restaurants, and they brought real locals to run them. The whole thing looks like it jumped right off the pages of the Arabian Nights. And for a fee, you can even ride on one of their cute little Egyptian donkeys. My favorite attraction, though, has been La Danse du Ventre. It is the most unusual dancing I have ever seen. It is certainly not like the ballet they taught us in school. These women hardly move their legs. And if they do, it is with a curious little shuffle step. Instead, the dancers shake their bellies as if they were completely separate from the rest of their bodies. And how odd to see a woman dressed without a corset. Well, if you can use the word dressed, the few clothes they wear hardly cover their stomachs at all. I cannot say, however, that I enjoy their music as much as the dance. The noise those musicians make sounds like cats fighting in the night. One of them scrapes a bizarre string instrument with a horsehair bow, while another plucks at a zither-like thing in his lap. A third plays a flute that sounds like a bagpipe of all things. And the screeching is set to bizarre rhythms, unlike anything we learned in music class. Even the dancers participate, well, when they're not performing, by singing, if you can call it that, and playing the tambourine. But the most annoying sound of all was the constant clanking of the brass castanets that the dancers wear on their fingers. Oh, how they made my ears ring. I have often wondered what these dancers' lives are like in their own countries. I discovered that they are from many different places. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. I have also been told the dancing is looked down upon in their cultures, yet I do not see the shame in being able to move one's muscles in that extraordinary manner. I must say that I consider myself extremely lucky to have seen it, and without ever having to leave the comforts of Paris. Sadly, all good things must come to an end. The exposition will finish the end of October, but I certainly intend to visit several more times before it closes. Perhaps I should buy your daughter a set of those brass castanets the dancers wear. That way, the incessant noise will constantly remind you of your ever-loving sister. With great fondness and best wishes, Elizabeth. So, this 
this, um, this kind of short animation is based on a letter that was sent by one of the visitors of the Exposition Universelle of 1867 to her sister. And um, it was very interesting for us to look at the text of this letter and analyze all the different uh, cliches that are kind of um, put forward through the text that started off as a very personal observation. Um, one of the things, for instance, is when the lady mentioned something about the difference between ballet and oriental dancing. She's trying to make sense of something that, you know, she is not accustomed to. The other thing, for instance, which is very interesting is when she says she could experience the entire world, in particular the Rue du Caire, without having to leave the comforts of the city of Paris. So there's, in a sense, an attempt through this exhibition or the experience of this visitor was one whereby the world could be reduced into a display, could be reduced into an exhibition of sorts. And through this exhibition, certain images of the cultures and the places that are represented are formulated in the visitor's head. And the organizers of the exhibition went to great length in order to simulate as much as possible the experience of authenticity, of reality. So she tells you that the dancers that she saw came all the way from Cairo or from Turkey. And as a matter of fact, historically speaking, this was not entirely true. A lot of these dancers were brought from the you know, the district of Montmartre taught to dance a little bit, and then they were put on stage. Some, you know, some of the anomalies, some of the inconsistencies in the presentation of that street is that the same building that was used for a mosque, although it was built in the direction of Mecca, like any proper mosque, was actually used at the same time as a cafe, which is something that you would never see in an actual real mosque. So the idea of mixing the real and the unreal, the authentic and the non-authentic, the shifting perspectives of whose reality are we presenting and according to whose perspective is something that we found very interesting in this little document that comments from a personal perspective on this Exposition Universelle of 1867. And if images speak a thousand words, you can imagine how many millions of words an assemblage of images in the context of an exhibition could, could tell. And this is, in a sense, through this example, this is what, we, what is the starting point for the thinking behind the exhibition Tea with Nefertiti, or how art shapes the images of cultures, how artworks, how artifacts, how artists can be placed within the context of a certain mechanism of display, and through that display, create a certain knowledge that is given with a certain authority as a final word on the topic. And because of that, the visitor acquires that knowledge and believes that this is what this representation or what the display represents. So why Nefertiti, in a sense, or why Egypt? As we were looking at um, you know, different things and we were formulating our thoughts for the exhibition, we felt that the example of Egyptian collections or collecting Egyptian art in the history of museums was a very, very rich one and was full of a lot of examples that we could draw on in order to use as a case study through which we can open this discussion about how do exhibitions, how do artworks create images of other cultures. And by way of introduction, let me give you an example by looking at these three different incidents. So this first example, uh, you can tell that there's something in common between these three pictures. Could someone uh, maybe try to um, comment on what is co co in common between these three images. Something that they all share. The Sphinx. And the Sphinx is what, in a sense? It is what kind of art? It is ancient Egyptian art. If you look at these three images, they all have a presence of a monument that draws its inspiration or is actually 
an object of ancient Egyptian art, of Pharaonic art. So you have the same type of art coming up in the three images, in the three contexts, but they are each used in a completely different way. In this first image, we are looking at the installation of a very important work of art that exists today in the British Museum, the bust of Ramses II. In 1813, uh, the British Consul General sought a permission from Muhammad Ali of Egypt to excavate in Egypt. And he hired a circus man called Belzoni to do the excavations. And Belzoni went there, hired some people, you know, some people got paid, some people didn't get paid, some people worked to death, some people ran away. It was all very shady. And he found the bust of Ramses II and brought it to the British Museum. And it stands in the British Museum until today. And it is a great, great story of grand imperialism, of how British imperial rule or colonialism was saving the legacy of ancient civilization and presenting it to humanity at large. Nothing was, of course, thought about the ways in which the work arrived to Britain, to London, and eventually erected by 1816 in the Townley Galleries of the British Museum. But what's very interesting is how a work of ancient Egyptian art became a tool to promote a very strong imperial agenda and image. So that's one example of how an artwork was creating a certain um, narrative, a certain discourse, a certain um, image of a certain place and a certain people. Let's look at the other example. The, the monument that's in the middle obviously looks like an ancient Egyptian sculpture, in particular a sphinx. And it has a very, very different story. It was 1920 when the Egyptian government a delegation in Paris discovered the work of one of the early modern artists of Egypt called Mahmoud Mukhtar and invited him to come to back to Cairo and erect a big monument that can be used as a symbol of the modern Egyptian nation. So Mahmoud Mukhtar came back and without making the story too long, he went through a lot of you know, phases. Sometimes the government was giving money, sometimes they were not giving money. Yeah. But basically, in, a, in an eight-year period, he managed to create a lot of awareness about this important monument that was revealed to the public on May 20 in 1928. And we were very lucky to actually come across the film of the unveiling, which we can look at. This is from the ceremony of the unveiling of the film. And you see the British Consul General arriving, all the dignitaries are seated. Um, and this was right outside the train station, okay? Ba uh, Midan Ramses, it was called later Midan Ramses. At the time it was called Bab al Hadid, okay? This was right outside the train station in the city of Cairo, the new train station. You see the British Consul talking to some of the ministers. This is the King Fuad, the father of King Faru, sitting there. Um, in all royalty. He was not very keen on the event because when Mukhtar came back from uh, uh, Europe, he wanted him to create a bust of the king. The king wanted Egypt to be symbolized in a bust of himself. Mukhtar thought, no, we have to look at ancient Egyptian art and create a monument that uses Egyptian glorious past in order to comment on the modern nation of Egypt. So you see all these dignitaries, the ladies dressed in the latest fashions of the time. And eventually, the unveiling takes place. There were some problems with the curtains. It took a little longer. The king was a little upset. But eventually, there it is in all its grandness. A, a modern Egyptian woman lifting up her veil, looking towards the future, and leaning on the sphinx of the glory of ancient Egyptian you know, uh, past to kind of move forward to the future. And the Sphinx is even coming up, pushing both front you know, uh, paws upwards. So this is a very interesting example of another artwork where, again, the reference is to ancient Egyptian art, but the image of the culture is that of independence, of great national pride, and not imperial um, you know, hegemony or imperial colonialism. 
And then the third example is a more current example from 2006, comes to us uh, again from Egypt, where there was a very important sculpture of Ramses II placed outside the train station. In 1955, Jamal Abdel Nasser removed Egypt awakening, the sculpture of Mukhtar, which we just saw, and replaced it by this huge statue of Ramses II. But in 2006, the Egyptian government moved it into a place in Giza. You can see it there lying in its current position. And a project for a museum was supposed to begin, but still nothing has happened, unfortunately, and the uh, statue is there. Now, what's interesting, and this documentation comes from a film in the exhibition called A God Passing, is what's interesting is what people were speaking about as the sculpture was going. And one person, you see him here saying, this is, we shouldn't move the sculpture. This is our great, great grandfather. We should be proud of it and keep it in the center. But other people were saying, no, we are Muslims. This is haram. We don't believe in sculptures. Good riddance. It's good that we're getting rid of it. So it's interesting how ancient Egyptian art in the year 2006 acquired a completely different meaning. And it was no longer unifying everyone around it as an emblem of national you know, unity. So basically, these are three interesting examples that show us how an artwork, the same artwork or the same art style, can be used in different ways to create different images and different narratives related to a specific culture. And this is, in a sense, what brings us to Nefertiti. If there's anything that connects with the general public as a symbol of Egypt, probably Nefertiti is one of the most iconic symbols. And there is a reason for that, of course. You know, the work started as a very humble excavation. In 1911, it was discovered by Ludwig Brockhardt. It was then, under very conspicuous circumstances, taken to uh, Germany. But there it was not exhibited until 1922 and 1923. And it was placed in different places. It was in the house of the funder who funded the ex ex expedition, the excavation. It was then hidden by the Nazis many years later because they were afraid that it might be destroyed during the war. Then an American unit in the American army found it in a salt mine. This is one of the American officers in the American base in Wiesbaden. I mean, it has a very interesting history around it until eventually it was given to Western Germany before the unification. It was sitting in Charlottenburg at the Dahlem Museum. And after the unification, it moved to the Altis Museum. And now it is in the beautifully renovated Neues Museum, which was the original place where it first was shown back in 1923. So it's very interesting how this work has gone through so many different iterations, from an artwork to a very important museological piece, but also to an iconic symbol that is used in all sorts of contexts, on postcards, on banknotes, you know, for tourism, uh, issues of provenance, should it belong to Germany, political diplomacy. I mean, it really went beyond being just an artwork. And this, in a sense, is the spine of the exhibition. So now we're getting into the actual, docu the actual structure of the exhibition and how all this kind of reasoning and research and thinking led to a certain um, experience, in a sense, whereby visitors can come and see artworks and through these artworks explore with us some of these questions that we are interested in. So the exhibition is divided into three sections, the artist, the museum, and the public. In other words, we are interested in asking the question, how does the meaning of an artwork change? And how does the power of an artwork change? And it becomes a tool to write these narratives and create these images when you see it through three angles. First, as an artwork. It's the end product of a creative process. An artist thinking of forms, of shapes, of personal topics of things that they find interesting, working in their studio and coming up with an artwork. In that context, the artwork has a completely different value and meaning and significance than when it moves, for instance, into a museum display. This is why 
at the beginning of every section in the exhibition, the artist, the museum, the public, we start with a work that is about Nefertiti and that illustrates the main emphasis of that section. So the first image that you see is a work by Egyptian photographer Yusuf Nabil of the bust itself. And the focus is really on the actual artwork. You see the colors, you see the shaping, you see the, you know, uh, the raised cheekbones, the beautiful V shape and the <coughs> elongated neck that gives the queen a certain regality, a certain kind of refinement and elegance. There's nothing about the context. It could be exhibited anywhere, but that is not the point. The idea is to focus on the artwork and the artistic innovation that the artist placed in making that artwork. When we look at the second picture, the story completely changes. This is an artwork, a photograph by a German photographer called Candida Hofer, who did a series of photographs at the Neues Museum upon its reopening in 2009. And of course, the you know, the main diamond in the, in the crown of the Neues Museum is Nefertiti. So as you go through all the Egyptian uh, artifacts, you eventually arrive to this beautiful domed hall that is definitely far bigger than what the size of this bust requires and is intended more as a throne room, in a sense, befitting for this queen. Now, the meaning of the word Nefertiti is the beautiful one has come. It's a beautiful meaning, no? But then this kind of narrative or story underlying this very grand presentation might mean the beautiful one has come to stay. She's not going anywhere. This is where it belongs. We own this work and it's rightfully ours. And this is a kind of display that shows the power behind this ownership. It's not about what the artist did and what it looks like. It's about the context and the politics behind it. So in a sense, this museological maneuver transforms the power of the artwork, transforms the meaning that we associate with the artwork, whether it's consciously or subconsciously related to us. Then let's look at the third um, example, which is the artwork that we use to introduce the public section. And it's actually a still from a film, and I will show you the film in a few seconds. The film is by uh, two artists that work together. Their name is Little Warsaw, they're from Hungary. And in 2003, when the bust of Nefertiti was still at the Charlottenburg Museum in West Berlin, the director of the museum at the time, Professor Wildung, Dieter Wildung invited these artists to create some sort of intervention with this ancient bust. So they actually built this body in the same proportion as the actual neck and the head. And for very, very few minutes, very short minutes, the director of the museum with a specialized art handler and with the artists and the journalists around removed the precious head of that ancient queen and placed it on this contemporary artwork that is supposed to be the body of Nefertiti. One would think it's a very courageous thing to do, to move this bust and to, to do that with it. Let's look a little bit as to how this looked like. So this is documentation of that actual performance. In 2003. When you feel like you can't breathe, what if it falls? What if something happens? This is not a joke. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and this is the real bust. This is not a replica.
I never oh, carried it, but I assume it's heavy. <laughs> it's solid stone. And this is actually the director of the museum on the, uh, you can see on the left. <laughs> it's too <Not> small. No <laughs> <laughs> And there she goes. Not quite yet. It's where she lost the eye. Yeah, this is why she lost her eye because of. <laughs> <laughs> Still was saying that. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine. Basically, the reason why we use this installation, of course, we didn't bring back the Nefertiti bust, and I will show you in a few minutes what the installation looked like in the exhibition. Um, this intervention caused a huge scandal. In 2003, when, when this you know, uh, installation happened, the Ministry of, uh, you know, of uh, Antiquities, led by Zai Hawass at the time, raised a complete, complete objection to this. And they cut all the diplomatic ties with Egypt. They asked all the Egyptian archaeologists, uh, sorry, the German archaeologists in Egypt to leave. And they immediately asked for the repatriation of the bust. You are being disrespectful to our queen. You're putting her on a naked body, so on and but so forth. I think now is a good moment to see you actually see the full statue with the sculpture on top of it. And I think now you get a sense that this person was a real. Oh, this, this so, like oh yes. So that this person was actually a real human being at one point, besides being a queen. Um, and I think the interesting thing about this installation is the reaction that you had. You were laughing and you can't actually believe that it really is the actual bust. We had the same reaction, you know, when you first see the piece. But it really makes a very, very important point about how the value of an actual artwork has changed so much. You know, why do we get so worried? Oh, my God, if it breaks or whatever happens to it. You know, at the end, it's a piece of rock. It's beautiful and it's old, but what has happened? Why do we regard it with uh, such awe and so are so afraid of doing such an installation? In um, defense of the director, you know, he also faced a lot of heat for this. And why can you allow this? And how can you do something like this? Well, the question is actually in return, why not? You know, if nothing happens to it, why not do this experiment and see what happens to the bust? How does it un or change our understanding and the meaning of it? And what does it teach us maybe about how these um, uh, symbols or how these uh, artworks have actually gone so far ingrained in our brains in the way we look at them and in the way we approach objects that we perceive as being valuable? So I think the shocking reaction really is an extremely precious one because it really prompts us to think about why do we look at certain artworks in the way we do, in fact, uh, look at them. So, And in a sense, this is one of the main questions that we raise through the exhibition. Who are the uh, assigners of value? Who assigns value to an object? Is it because a museum places it on a vitrine, on a pedestal, it becomes valuable? What if the curator had an argument with the artist before, for instance, and decided not to include him or her in an exhibition? Does that mean that they are not as good as the ones who get included? Who writes art history? If I, if I were to ask you now, who are the most important artists ever in the 20s or the 30s or the 40s? I'm sure Modigliani comes to mind, maybe, you know, Picasso, uh, Miro, uh, Dali, you know, all these names have, we have been told again and again and again from a very young age at school, at university, when we go to museums, to collections, that these are the important artists. Were there other artists that were as interesting working in a different place, working in a different way, that maybe were not included in this narrative and deserve at least proper investigation before we shut them out or include them in the annals of art history. 
So it's very, very interesting to ask these questions and in a way go beyond the final authority that these institutionalized mechanisms present the artwork through. So, um, yeah, she's safely tucked back into her vitrine. <laughs> we can leave her there for now. I mean, uh, actually, just when you look at the display case that you see, this like quite ugly looking, you know, plinths and that cover. So when you look at the photograph by Candida Höfer in here, so even how the presentation was upgraded actually changes the value or how you look at that piece fundamentally effectively. It is not at all the same in this rather dull looking building, you know, that had maybe the charm of, you know, a tax collection agency or something in, uh, in Berlin to this grand, beautiful uh, building on the Museum Island in Berlin that was so majestically uh, renovated by, by David Chipperfield. So really, you can see these mechanisms are extremely powerful, in fact. Um, it's, I guess, like buying a fake Prada back, you know, somewhere uh, on the street in, in some street market. Could be the same bag, but if it's in the actual store where you only have maybe three handbags in an otherwise empty shop, you will think of it in a very different way, in fact. And the same mechanisms are really quite um, effective when it comes to looking at art as well. So I think this was, uh, in a way, the first half of our presentation. And now we would like to go through the actual exhibition uh, and give you a walk through the show and select a few examples of how some of these ideas were articulated in the actual displays in the exhibition. So we're going to focus on the first presentation of the show, which happened in Mathaf, the Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha, and that was from November 17, 2012 until March 31st. And I think Nuria told you that it then went to Paris and then to the IVAM in Valencia. And next, this year, I'm still saying next year, in May, it opens as a final kind of stop uh, at the Egyptian Museum, the newly opened Egyptian Museum in Munich which is really a dream come true for the show to be placed within an exhibition, a museum that hosts an amazing collection of ancient Egyptian works. So that was the way we installed the entrance. And um, it's basically a little uh, introduction to the show or a little introduction to the first section in the show. You are, you are, uh, for any of you who are familiar with ancient Egyptian art, the raised arms is a very, very common motif uh, specifically in the Ptolemaic period and then the Hellenistic period going into the Coptic age. And it's a sign of prayer, basically. And a contemporary artist, Nida Sinnukrot, uh, saw this, saw actually, um, I don't know if you're starting to see it, it's behind that shaft, uh, a stela, very similar to this one, in one of his many trips to the Egyptian museum in Cairo and decided to interpret it with this contemporary artwork. So this is basically the greeting gesture that welcomes you into the exhibition, Tea with Nefertiti, and it kind of foreshadows the first section of the show, which looks at how artists work. They see something, they receive a certain inspiration, and then they negotiate what they see, they appropriate it, they add onto it, and they contribute their own um, work, their own uh, point of view. So the first section, the artist section, you will recognize this work. We just spoke about it by Yusuf Nabil. It's the first work that greets you to tell you, look at the artwork. Don't look at what's happening around it. This is the focus of this section. And you go through different works that look at how artists sought a certain inspiration and then created their own uh, contribution to what they saw. So this example, for instance, is uh, coming to us from the same artist who built the monumental sculpture, Egypt Awakening, with the lady covering the veil and the Sphinx rising up, Mahmoud Mukhtar. And these are works from the 20s also. And you see how, in his work, he was looking at ancient Egyptian art, the block statues, and recreating them in a style that also spoke to what he was witnessing and learning as an artist in the 20s in Paris. So it's about this negotiation and merging of different periods and styles. This is another sculpture by Mukhtar, and it's very interesting when you compare it to the Coptic stela that is at the top. I don't know if you can recognize the motif of the stairs in the stela with the cross on top of it. 
again, the steps are a very interesting example, uh, motif that comes up in ancient Egypt. And it used to have sometimes the cartouche of the, the name of the pharaoh on top of the step, meaning he's the most powerful one. Uh, the Copts took the same motif and placed the cross on top, saying Christianity is now the new culture that we all need to ascribe to. Mukhtar placed the peasant, the local Egyptian peasant, on top of the stairs and gave him a very, very proud kind of stance, saying the local Egyptian should be now the most worthy of our respect and our, um, you know, lifting up. Now, what's interesting is what an artist like Paul Klee did with the same motif. Paul Klee was in Egypt in 1928, and he saw the same motifs, but he used them in a purely formalistic way. He did not kind of recruit the actual motif in order to create a political gesture, to make a statement about the local Egyptian person. For him, it was a way to break free from the academic kind of styles of painting that were very common or dominant in Europe and create a new vernacular, a new formal vernacular. So you can see how two artists went to the same source and each of them applied it in a context that fits their own story or their own concerns and their own background. I'm not, I'm not going to stop at every example, but another example, for instance, comes from Giacometti, who also was very fascinated by Egyptian sculpture. If you think of his uh, statues, you always have one leg forward and one leg backwards, and this comes from Egyptian sculpture. And here you see an example of how he negotiated ancient, uh, the heads of the priests from the New Kingdom. So you can see his sculpture, and you can see its relationship to um, another ancient sculpture. I'm going to move now. I mean, the example is self-evident. Vic Muniz's Tupperware mummy, um, where he's also taking the mummy and reinterpreting in a, in, a, in a funny new way. And then we go into the museum section. And again, we start with Nefertiti and the work by Candida Hofer. And the whole first gallery takes you back into those traditional, conventional 19th or turn of the 20th century museums. And in the same way that we looked at Mukhtar in the artist section, we're looking at Mukhtar again. But in this case, the sculptures that we see of the Egyptian modernist Mukhtar are placed in the context of how they were first exhibited. So you see the work, and behind it you have an image blown into real room size of what the context of that presentation was like back in 1922 in Cairo, or 1930 in the Galerie Bernheim Jeanne in Paris, or in 2010 at the opening of the Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha. So how does the context of an exhibition alter our perception and evaluation of an artwork? And what's very interesting, you can see it a little bit there, is the catalog from an exhibition that Mukhtar had in Paris in 1930 at a gallery that still exists until now called the Bernheim Jeanne. The cover of the catalog says Mukhtar, sculpteur, and the main title is L'art égyptien contemporain, Egyptian contemporary art. Now what's interesting is the same gallery was showing artists like Picasso at the time, Susan Valadon, but they never said contemporary Spanish art. It was only Picasso. But when it came to Mukhtar, it was important to place him within the culture of Egypt. And with that come a certain set of expectations, a certain set of images that probably were formulated from as early on as the Exposition Universelle. The 1001 Night, Islamic Art, Harun al-Rashid, all the cliches that you can think of. So of course his work has to be about the pharaohs or about the harem. You know how these things happen. It don't happen over one day. They take many, many years and sometimes centuries to formulate. I want, I want to quickly add something to that particular point. I think really the curatorial argument, if you want, starts in this mid-19th century, I would say. And this is the time when all these excavations of uh, ancient Egyptian artwork started to happen, and these objects were being brought to Europe. Sometimes there were colonial uh, connections, sometimes it was more trade or genuine curiosity. However, what had happened is that more and more big cities built these Egyptian museums and showcased these Egyptian collections. Now, while they're, of course, very interesting and they teach a lot, they 
until today, to a certain extent, come to shape an image of a culture, and in this case of Egypt, that we still have in our minds. So oftentimes when we you know, talk about Egypt or you, you ask anyone in Egypt, the images that you have are those of pyramids, of the Sphinx, of the Nefertiti bust, and maybe something about the revolution on Tahrir Square most recently. But there really isn't very much in the middle in between. So what happened in the, to artists like Mukhtar, for example, they were coming to the centers, so-called centers of artistic production. They were in Paris, maybe going to art schools. That image actually clashed a little bit or coincided with an artist simply just trying to in, draw inspiration of something that is in his own cultural past. Now, what happened, the effect of that is, while a lot of European or other modernist artists were allowed the freedom and until today are labeled the great innovators, whether it is about abstract art or whatever you see. But an artist that actually comes from the region doing exactly the same thing, maybe just reinterpreting ancient motifs or ancient art artifacts, were then labeled ethnic. You know, it's almost like folk art of sorts. When Picasso does these drawings of, you know, the bulls, the contour drawings, this is exactly a direct consequence and inspiration of older uh, such drawings that you find in Egypt that were done a few thousand uh, years ago. You find them in Luxor and the temples. So a bull that is running by maybe having two lines underneath, and it looks like in these comics, you know, a running bull. But that was actually done a few thousand years ago. On the one hand, these are written and interpreted as great innovators, while other artists simply were not able to have that same freedom. So in a sense, the image of cultures that are in someone's heads inevitably, very powerfully, um, lead to value judgments or even interpretations of any artwork that you encounter anywhere. And I think to add to Till's point, we're looking at a very interesting example from one of the displays in the exhibition. And we're equally guilty. Obviously, our exhibition is formulating a certain narrative. So we are not saying that our exhibition is free of, uh, you know, proposing certain ideas. We hope that we are opening a discussion and not giving a final word. But every curator is, a sense, in a sense, the, a dictator to a certain extent. Uh, but this is a very interesting example of another artist called Georges Sabah, who was originally from Egypt, but arrived to Paris at a very early age in 1906. And he remained there and had a very, very successful career. And this is a work from 1921. And, um, we wanted to make this commentary on the origins of an artist and how they might influence the way we perceive or evaluate the work. So on one side we have his Egyptian passport and on the other side we have his French passport. Now if you were to look at the artwork only with the French passport and you say this is a work by a French artist in 1921, you might think, oh well, you know, it's okay. There have been better ones or there's, you know, more interesting ones. Now look at the same painting with the Egyptian passport and say, this is a work by an Egyptian artist in 1921 and go, oh wow, good for them. They managed to do this as early back as 1921. I never thought that they were so advanced in terms of their artistic language. So it's very interesting how these little kind of points alter the way we see, we evaluate, and it's important at least to be aware of them. Um, so moving on, you know, how much time do we still have before we open it up to questions? We need, we need about 10 more minutes here. Is that, um, is that okay? 10 minutes? Can you still handle 10 minutes of me talking? No, I'll interrupt you. <laughs> okay, so before, uh, now I want to show you just uh, a short film by one of the contemporary artists, William Kentridge. Uh, just a little snap of it because it really connects to what we're looking at and then we're almost done. Um, so we are in the museum section, and we're looking at how the displays in a museum create certain images or certain narratives. And let's look at this quickly. Let's just do it quickly, and then we're, we're done. No, I'm going to talk about some other more important things. OK. This is a copy of the work. It's not the actual work, uh, I mean, for, for copyright reasons. So this is uh, South African contemporary artist William Kentridge, 
And in a series of films that he did for the Louvre in 2010, he was invited to intervene with the actual Egyptian collection there. And what's interesting is what he's doing. He's measuring, he's kind of like taking notes. He even at some point starts listening to the artwork. I'm just showing you, you know, <laughs> measuring it according to himself. And in a way, he's assuming the role of the traditional curator as a custodian of a collection. And whatever the curator decides and writes down and goes into the books becomes actually the authority, becomes the text that is written in the art history books. But what about all the things that the curator chooses not to include in the book? What happens of those? So this is just an example of how a curator can become part of this um, of these tools, of these mechanisms. Um, and in, in connection to that, yeah. Till, and then we can go to the public section. Yeah, I, th there. I think in terms of museum practices and curatorial, um, I think what, what makes the, uh, our attempt at creating an exhibition that is quite different here, you can see in uh, this example, um, it was very important for us when you create an exhibition that tries to show how an image of a culture is created through the arts. And as such, Egypt really is an example. You know, you can make the same example with pretty much any cultural image in the world. But it is very important for us also to go radically against traditional museum classifications and groupings. So we made a very conscious choice, for example, to juxtapose works from very, very radically different periods. You have a contemporary uh, artwork here, a photography by um, uh, Thomas Struth. It's a photography in the Pergamon Museum in Germany, in Berlin again. Looks a little ancient, Egyptian, even though it's not at all, but <laughs> we, we cheated a bit. But you see visitors in this museum looking at art. So you have a reference to a historic period. And here you are, as the visitor to the exhibition, not really looking at the artwork. You are looking at the people looking at the artworks. And this is, in fact, a very important step in terms of the formalistic um, you know, expression of this artist. But it is something that was also done a few hundred years ago in this Honoré Daumier that you see on the left side. Um, this piece is called O Commissum Moche les Egyptiens, Comment sont faits los Egyptos? And uh, basically, when you see these people that look at these grotesque figures on the wall, supposedly looking at figures of Egyptians has absolutely nothing to do with it. But again, you have this engagement of people passing by, looking at objects and drawing conclusions and thinking they are understanding or looking at another culture in these objects. The works are separated by a very long time span, but similar things and similar mechanisms are actually in effect. And I want, can you go to the yeah. Iowa way? So this is also a very important um, uh, classification, a very important um, grouping in this exhibition. We have in the middle um, a big ceramic sculpture by a contemporary British artist called Grayson Perry. On the left, we have an old vase, ancient Neolithic vase by, uh, well, it is an ancient vase, but it's uh, by uh, a Chinese vase by, uh, but it's not by anyone, but Ai Weiwei, the famous Chinese artist, found it and put Coca-Cola on it. And on the right, you have an actual um, so-called Islamic art object. Now, when you look at these three pieces together, you really think, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of ceramics. You know, They could all be the same somehow. But what is really very important to understand that they are very different and never really shown together. Grace and Perry in the middle, it's a contemporary art object that looks as if it's an ancient art object. When you look closer, you see contemporary motifs, etc., etc. But it has the effect that you actually are quite surprised when you go up close and you see, really, this is not old. It's actually contemporary. And it questions you how you look at old art. When you look at Ai Weiwei, the Coca-Cola vase, and ironically, this is the oldest piece in the trio. It's really 2,000 years old. But Ai Weiwei wrote Coca-Cola on it. And because we are so trained to seeing this logo, it is maybe the first piece that we are actually drawn to visually. We quickly understand, we quickly have an access to it, but it really is a 2,000-year-old vase that all of a sudden became really valuable. It was a mundane pot. It became highly valuable because Ai Weiwei, the famous artist, just put Coca-Cola on it and made a statement about destruction of cultures and images. But it is an old piece that actually looks new, 
Grayson Perry created a, it's a new piece that actually looks old. And then you have this Islamic art uh, bowl in this uh, case that is really kind of in the middle. Now why is this so significant? It actually shows in a very clear way how limiting sometimes traditional museum categories or art historical classifications really are. Why should we look at, or why should we have to look at Islamic art or old art differently from contemporary art? They can teach us similar things. We can look at what happened when this piece was created. We can understand an old artwork within the time frame it was actually created. We can understand the old piece as of today, from a period of today, and vice versa. So if, for example, you look at a term like Islamic art, which is suggesting there is something uniform and it's conclusive, but Islamic art really spends 800 years, 1, and 1,500 uh, years. Well, Islam, yeah, kind of, and uh, yes. Yeah, not understanding Islam, I'm saying the art, well, kind of, whatever, depends on how you define it again. But the problem is that it spends all this time in the culture from Northern Africa all the way to, to Asia, and to group this into one conclusive term called Islamic art is almost grotesque, you know, it is sort of saying there is something like Christian or Western art. Now the effect of these things is that they are grouped and separated, and we feel it is very important actually to make those radical juxtapositions and go across these things and see what does it actually teach us and how does it change the understanding of certain art objects and how does it facilitate or maybe questioning in a sense how we look at art at large. So the museum section in Tivat Nefertiti is probably the key section in dissecting and analyzing mechanisms that are at work to create an image or even a guideline of how we look at art. Nobody questions a label. When you see a museum label, most people believe it because you know if it's on the wall, it must be true. But who says that? And who decided what is being put on this label? Who decides on a classification? Who, de who decides on how I'm going to divide the collection in a larger museum? This is all done by people, by art historians, by people like us, by curators, who decide how things are supposed to be looked at, and that in turn has quite powerful implications for the value um, you know, of, of an image or that is a, a, a ascribed to a particular artwork. So I think this is really quite important, and uh, before I give to Sam, the idea of the show is not really to say this is how the world is. Many exhibitions have such uh, you know, a contention, they want to tell you, this is how this artist worked. This is how this period is. This is what contemporary Egyptian artists are doing nowadays. This is what Arab art looks like. This is what you know, this is, and, and so on. This exhibition takes a different approach. It really asks a whole series of questions and really challenges visitors at large to question the next time you go and see an exhibition, is that really all true what I'm being told in there? Or is there a way to make very, very different connections to those artworks that might fundamentally change the meaning of them? So this is really the idea behind it. It's an exhibition that is really asking a lot of questions rather than just formulating preset answers. So you can. And I think that's a very good place to end, actually, till summarize it really well. <laughs> And um, this is just showing you how the installation of the little Warsaw piece, the body of Nefertiti, so we have the actual statue and the film plays in the background. And as you approach it, at one point, you feel that the actual statue, when they place it, when they place the bust on the body, it feels that they are really back together in the room. So it has a very strong visual impact if you, you know, when you approach it from the right angle. And just to give you one more example of an artwork that illustrates the concept of the public section, the last section in the show. Uh, this is an element from a bigger installation by Ala uh, Yunus called, the, the, called basically Nefertiti. Um, and this is what the installation looks like. In the 19, early 1960s, the Egyptian government subsidized the local manufacturing of these sewing machines. And they were called Nefertiti. Now, and you could see the bust of Nefertiti on them. And the artist discovered this and collected them and made this installation with five of them and a film about this. And it was very interesting to see how the Egyptian government to kind of uh, 
uh, distribute and market a project of modernization, encouraging women to buy the sewing machine, to work from home, and then make more money to send their kids to university or to school, felt that if they called the machine Nefertiti, more people would buy it because everybody has a positive connection with the Egyptian queen, the most important queen in the history of Egypt. So it's a very interesting example of how an artwork in this case is used in a completely different setting. It has nothing to do with the museum. It has nothing to do with the artist. It's really about mobilizing the masses. Yes. And, and this is also a very important point, actually. You know, when, in a sense, and we are, on, you know, Sam is originally Lebanese. I'm originally uh, German. So we are having a lot of discussions about perceptions of cultures and artworks also when we conceive exhibitions. And this is a very key point in the show as well. When you talk about an image of a culture, there are really four different angles. There is, say, if you take Spain and Egypt as an example, Spain and the Arab world, there is an image that Spain has of itself, negotiates with itself, creates of itself. There is an image internationally, say, for example, in the Arab world, of Spain, you know, maybe about, uh, I don't know, tapas, torero, and like the same, you know, five things that you, any culture you flamenco. can limit it to, flamenco and so on and uh, whatnot. <laughs> but then there's also the same thing on the other way around. So, you know, there's a certain image of Egypt, for example, that you have in Spain, that you have in Germany, wherever that is. And there is an image that is created within Egypt itself. So by having, you know, having said that, maybe museums look at pyramids and the Sphinx and Nefertiti. I think uh, installation of Ala Yunus is a very good example of how countries self-exploit those things and use them. You know, you, you would try to sell sewing machines by putting the Nefertiti bust on them, even though Nefertiti really has nothing, she, she, you know, she would have never used one. <laughs> but uh, I think also, uh, to promote tourism, you know, it is really uh, at the moment also where the country is in this transition, you know, several changes of government, revolution, where does it go? How do we negotiate even an Islamic past? Is that more important than maybe the pre-Islamic history? So what value do we place on symbols and cultural achievements and objects that were created before Islamic times? Or should we try to negate them? In a sense, it's like Christianization in Europe, you know, what do we place value on? How did, when Christianity came about, what did we do with all the stuff that happened before, you know, Jesus uh, came and, and we changed our religion? How, what did the Spanish do when they were in Latin America? You know, how do you merge maybe traditions in Mexico of previous cultures with Catholicism and so on? So the self-negotiation of an image and the self-creation of your own history and your own, um, uh, uh, you know, cultural image is at least as powerful as that done from the outside. So you have always, it's quite a complex thing, that's why there is never an easy answer. But this negotiation of cultural images is really quite a complex thing and it is within this complex uh, patchwork, if you will, that we are nowadays looking at a lot of exhibitions, for example, of a contemporary Egyptian artist who is in a position of having to explain everything that there is to explain about his country. And for sure, nowadays, he has to talk about the revolution or he's simply not considered interesting, when maybe he just wants to talk about uh, the death of a parent, for example, as an artist. So to, to finish off, we're coming to the very end of the exhibition and following from what Till was saying, one of the last installations by two artists you see this, uh, these pyramids in a long corridor. These are works by an Egyptian artist where he took uh, images of how the pyramid, which is very emblematic, of course, of Egypt, um, how the pyramid is used in different commercial settings. So this, the green ones are from a brand, from a beer brand. The ones in the middle are the famous Al-Ahram newspaper pyramids, you know, logo. And the one at the very end is from the camel cigarettes. You see it on the picture, you know, on the cigarette packets. And then in the room, the red room, we were playing a film by Maha Ma'moon, another Egyptian artist, called Domestic Tourism. It's a one-hour film that consists of many, many clippings from Egyptian movies from the 40s until very recently of how the pyramids appear inside Egyptian movies. So in some films, they are the setting of a very domestic encounter between two lovers. In another one, there's a police raid on a drug deal. In another film, there's a big national parade at the bottom of the pyramid. So again, how do we self 
negotiate and express ourselves through certain images. And in that kind of environment, at the end, we created a sense of a cinema room. And there's this poster of a film called Nefertiti, the Queen of the Nile. This is the German version of the film, Nofretete. And um, as you see, as you come into the end, you're back at the very, very beginning with the same work that we started. And we wanted Nefertiti to be the last person to greet you out of the exhibition and kind of send you out with a little cautionary tale that, as we were saying throughout, whenever you're looking at an artwork, always remember that there are so many layers to what that artwork means and how it can be inserted into so many different types of narratives. And um, there we are back at the very beginning. So I guess now we can open the floor for any questions or comments or observations or, um, or um, objections <laughs> that you might have. <laughs>